Good morning, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure I welcome you all to the third day session of the Sri Lanka Surgical Congress 2021. Starting today's program, we will have two meet the expert sessions in uh, Hall A and Hall B. In Hall A, uh, the experts in hepatobiliary surgery will be discussing on safe dissection in the cystohepatic triangle. We'll have Dr. Sandun Bulat Singhala, Dr. Malit Nandasena, and Professor Aloka Patirana uh, illustrating on uh, this topic in Hall A. And in Hall B, we'll have uh, chest drain management and access to intrathoracic organs and the cardiothoracic experts and uh, Dr. Sujiva Ilan Gamage and Dr. Saman Pradeep will be in Hall B. Uh, to start today's proceedings, uh, let me invite Dr. Sandun Bulat Singhala and Dr. Malit Nandasena uh, to uh, start the meet the expert session in Hall A. Over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, breakfast sessions uh, on day three of Surgical Congress. And uh, <clears throat> today's topic for discussion is uh, safe dissection in the cystohepatic triangle. And why it is important uh, to have a safe dissection in the cystohepatic triangle? Uh, you know, we all know. Uh, Symptomatic ghost tone disease is a benign condition and the laparoscopic cholecystectomy has become the standard of care. And the safe dissection is important. It's merely to avoid iatrogenic bile duct injury uh, because it's a uh, recognized known complication, but it's a devastating one, which has a significant impact on quality of life, both physically and also psychosocially. And the other problem is the medical legal liabilities. Although it is not considered as a significant problem in the Sri Lankan setting at present compared to Western world, but it will be in the future with increasing awareness among general public about the surgery and complications. The worldwide incidence of iatrogenic bile duct injury ranges from 0.4 to 0.6. And Sri Lankan, we don't have uh, many Sri Lankan data regarding the Sri Lankan incidence, but uh, according to the papers that we have at the moment, we are in par with the worldwide figures. But um, I wonder whether it's underreported because of the proper improper uh, referral system plus not having a good recording mechanism. Uh, because we still, being in a tertiary care referral center uh, at Columbus Hospital Teaching Hospital, we still get uh, quite frequent referrals, at least two cases per month, like, uh, and sometimes more. Most of the injuries that we come across are uh, minor injuries, which can be managed with endoscopic uh, biliary stenting. And some requires, uh, especially high line injuries with biliovascular injuries, uh, um, require major reconstruction, hepatic jejunostomy, sometimes right hepatectomy. So the key steps. Uh, in the safe dissection, 30 degree telescope. Having said that, some surgeons still use zero degree, so it's actually surgeon's preference, although the recommendation is to use 30 degree if you're available. So it's not only the telescope, and also to have a good camera operator. Um, and to have a safe dissection, it is important to have a good, uh, proper uh, port placement, and so, the recommendation is to have four ports, two 10 millimeter ports, one subbambilical, one epigastric, and two five millimeter ports uh, that is in the anterior axial line, uh, which is for the uh, retraction of the fundus of the gallbladder. And uh, the other one, uh, you can triangulate with the uh, epigastric port uh, as a working port. So surgery. Uh, is all about, not, not only laparoscopic, even open surgery is all about dissection in the right tissue plane and also uh, a, a good adequate traction and counter traction. So the first step is to have a um, 
the gold better grasping forceps should retract the fundus towards the right shoulder or in the 10 o'clock position. On the picture on the right side of the screen, uh, it is in the 12 o'clock position and on the other one is 10 o'clock. So the, rec the right uh, mechanism is to uh, retract the fundus of the gallbladder towards the right shoulder. And also, next one is uh, get a atraumatic uh, forceps to hold from the uh, in Hartman's pouch and retract it downwards to expose the anterior peritoneum, retract it upwards to expose the posterior peritoneum. Then, uh, um, opening of the posterior peritoneum to, uh, to provide mobility to the gallbladder and to open the cystohepatic triangle. So, as in this picture, so you can see uh, the opening of the posterior peritoneum. Now, the key point is uh, dissection with hook diatomy, use as flimsy as possible. You take a small bites, flimsy bites. If the hook can be seen through the tissues that you have grabbed, then that is the ideal uh, way to proceed. Do not take large chunks of tissues. Then identify uh, key landmarks. One is a uh, ruvia sulcus. So it's a sulcus to the right of the gallbladder, which usually contains the right, right side uh, hepatic uh, pedicles. But what is what travels through is, is not important for us at this uh, in this lecture. Uh, it is it is the location or the landmark. Use it as a landmark to have a safe dissection. So ruvia sulcus can be found in about 82% of the people. There are uh, it's 70, in 70% it is open type, and in in 18% uh, in there is no sulcus. So next is uh, so define the safe area for dissection. Now, if you draw an arbitrary line, horizontal line, along the uh, um, ruvia sulcus. The plane above the, that arbitrary line is a safe area for dissection. There's ve it's very unlikely that you will encounter the important structures, the uh, right hepatic duct or the common bile duct, common hepatic duct, if you uh, continue your dissection above this plane. So, so line above this is the uh, safe area for dissection. And this picture shows, uh, in this case, now you can see, uh, so, it's not seen, yeah. so you can see the common hepatic duct, yeah. you can see the common bile duct and common hepatic duct and also right hepatic duct. Here the, the operator has dissected in the danger zone and which ended up having a, a hole in the right hepatic duct. <clears throat> you should not go real down, but in this case, as you can see, there is no ruvia sulcus to have a landmark. So we will be discussing what can we do if you don't have these landmarks uh, in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> then uh, the whole purpose of this dissection is to achieve the critical view of safety, which includes uh, <clears throat> two tibular structures uh, running towards the gallbladder. So you can demonstrate these two tubular structures. One is the cystic duct, and the other one is the cystic artery. And not only that, you should also make sure, once you demonstrate the two, you should, before you start clipping and cutting, you should continue your dissection along the medial, of the medial wall of the gallbladder, at least one third of the way up in the gallbladder, to make sure that there are no structures going out or coming towards the gallbladder, other than the two structures that you uh, considered as the cystic duct and the cystic artery. So, so this is the, the critical view of safety. So several pictures to show the critical view of safety. So we have created a window above the cystic artery. So, so, so we complete our dissection in the cystohepatic triangle with the cystic artery as the only structure. So that should be the aim. So next step, I wouldn't say next step, it's uh, you should do that throughout the surgery. You have to operate, 
the surgeon has to confirm the, it's better to confirm the anatomy with the assistant, talk to the assistant, be open for suggestions and comments. Uh, and if you are the assistant of the surgery, just be a good critic, don't just hold the camera. If you think something is not safe, just tell that in a polite way, of course. Uh, then, because at the end of the day, it's, what matters is patient safety. So you identify these two structures to the absolute point of certainty before you make any irreversible steps. So then the next step is to clip and cut. I mean, you clip and cut uh, cystic duct and the cystic artery. First, you apply the uh, clips to the side of the body, the, the clips that, I, that is going to remain uh, with the patient. And apply the clips to the point of upper margin of the dissection. Do not try to apply the clips to the area where you have not dissected. Right? And also before you apply clips, now because now the goal, uh, we have used two retraction, one is to the fundus, one is to the infundibulum, to release the tension a bit and try to appreciate the normal anatomy. Sometimes this, uh, we have applied too much of traction, the CBD is tented with the cystic duct. So that can cause side wall of side, uh, CBD side wall injury. So release the tension a bit and appreciate the normal anatomy. Make sure there is no <coughs> excessive tension causing tension, uh, tenting of the C, uh, CBD and then apply the clips. This is a, this is called error trap and this is a, a situation where a cystic duct is hidden and draw against the common hepatic duct against, uh, draws the cyst common hepatic duct against the gallbladder. So this is like type 1 Miritsi, something like type 1 Miritsi syndrome. And uh, this is found in severe inflammation, impacted stones at the neck of the gallbladder, intrahepatic gallbladders, and also dense adhesions around the gallbladder. So, solution to this problem is also, uh, you know, that what we have discussed, stick to basics, define cystohepatic triangle, do not make any assumptions, you know, and try to appreciate the landmarks. And if you if you still can't go ahead, you, you can dissect the gallbladder in submucosal dissection because it's a benign condition. You don't have to achieve any uh, clearance in this. So you can dissect in submucosal plane. Or you can do a subtotal cholecystectomy. Or if you can't do that, I mean, you can even just uh, withdraw the... Uh, not do the surgery and withdraw the uh, ports and then uh, recover the patient because that can be done at a different date with proper Im uh, imaging with CT or MRCP and then uh, maybe at a uh, different setting with expertise available. So this is another principle, important principle called cusp principle. Uh, it says uh, the concern, uncertain, safety and stop. So. First, you may be concerned about uh, the dissection. Then, if you, then the next thing is you're uncertain about the anatomy. Then you're worried about the safety, then you have to stop. So this is a dynamic process. It, it, it changes from one individual to another. It, uh, it, it, is, uh, it also depends on the level of expertise and also the experience. What is concerned for a a junior consultant or a trainee he may not be concerned for a senior consultant. So to, uh, at the beginning or for trainees, if you are concerned, stop and please call for help. And when you call, for, when you ask for help, just wait until help arrives. Don't start dissecting uh, before your help comes. Then that can cause injuries. So, so it's a very important principle. So you should know uh, where you are and you should uh, consider um, when to call for help. So laparoscopic anatomy can be an illusion. What you see may not be the rea reality. This, this next two slides will demonstrate, these two pictures will show, uh, show you how this can be illusion. In this picture, I hope you all can appreciate the frog and uh, same thing if you look at it in a different angle, it's a hose. So likewise, laparoscopic anatomy also the same. I mean, that's why it's better to have a, a good assistant 
who will see things at a different angle, so then you can get ideas from him. And this is the other picture. So one can interpret this as a man playing the horn, and another one can interpret this as a, a woman's silhouette. So, to conclude, uh, a cholecystectomy done is not gallbladder removed, it is but a bile duct save. That is the take home message. Thank you. And over to Sandun Bulas. Thank, thank you, Malit. Uh, good morning to all of you. I'll be continuing my talk from where Malit stopped uh, on the same topic, safety section of cystohepatic triangle. Is bile duct injury a problem in 2021? With all the advancement in the techniques, instruments, fancy devices, and improved learning curve over three decades, we have many workshops, training and learning, but still the answer is yes. It's a significant problem. So we need to understand the basic anatomy related to a cholecystectomy which is the anatomy in the hepatic hilum, hepatodurinal ligament, and in the cystohepatic triangle. So this is the normal anatomy. You all know that we have numerous amount of variant anatomy. So overall arrangement of the intra and extra hepatic biliary tree. I hope you can appreciate the dotted line here. And uh, that is the, the hepatic hilum, I mean uh, the cystic plate. And above that is the intrahepatic biliary duct anatomy arrangement, which drains all segments of the liver from segment one to seven. So as surgeons, we all like to see preferred anatomy during our procedure. So if you have this, Malit had some nice pictures showing the, the the, the critical view of safety. If you achieve this, if you see this, when you put the telescope, then you are a happy surgeon. But still you can run into problems. Remember the illusion and the error trap Mali talked very nicely. So I would be taking you through a few intraoperative management of the deviation of the norm. We all know that we have, we are not always lucky, so we sometimes see thick contracted gallbladder, sometimes with the impacted stone in the Hartmann's pouch, Meritzi syndrome, acute severe cholecystitis or empyema with severe inflammation around the cystohepatic triangle, and variant biliary and vascular anatomy. So I'll take you through a few case scenarios. This is the intraoperative laparoscopic finding of a 48-year-old lady with symptomatic gallstone disease. She had recurrent colics, and in the ultrasound, there were multiple gallstones. The liver functions were normal, so how to deal? Of course, before discussing that, the importance of identifying the vascular anatomy. Why? It's to prevent this. We wouldn't like to see the pool of blood during the surgery, and why? Because hemorrhage in the cystohepatic triangle is a potential danger. We tend to be panic, and we will lose a critical view of safety, which is the utmost important thing to avoid bile duct injury. And then we try to inadvertently clamp, clip, or burn the site of bleeding, which can damage the, the right hepatic or the common hepatic artery. And it invariably leads into bile duct injury. So the variant anatomy, there are many pictures if you Google. So it, the, the origin of the cystic artery, the number of cystic arteries, the location of the cystic arteries, the commonest that we see is arising from the right hepatic artery, but it can from the left hepatic, proper hepatic, gastrodurinal, it can be multiple, it can be within the cystohepatic triangle, it can be away from the cystohepatic triangle. So, What is this? If you, I know it's difficult to read, but if you look closely, it says caterpillar turn or a Moynihan's hump. Likewise, sometimes you have to look close to appreciate the anatomy. So you see the cystohepatic triangle, which is a triangular area, which is 
which is shown here. And you tend to think that this is the cystic artery which is in the cystopathic triangle, but it's not. It's a right hepatic artery which, which makes a U-shaped turn within that and gives rise to short anterior and posterior cystic arteries. So if you concentrate on this triangular area in the two pictures, what is a caterpillar hump? When the right hepatic artery replaces the cystic artery within the cystohepatic triangle and it is tortuous and projects forward to the right of the common hepatic duct, like a hump of a caterpillar back and it forms a U-shape. That is a caterpillar turn. So if you appreciate this is the same thing which has happened in the previous picture. So how to deal with such situations? Of course, Malik discussed most of the salient points of how to do a safe dissection. There will be a little bit of repetition, but stay close to gallbladder. You are going to dissect, hug in the gallbladder, and not away from that towards the cephalid or towards the hilum. So lymph, lymph node of Lund is an important landmark. It's just a fraction of fraction away from lymph node upwards is a safe area. You all know that the artery is closely related to that. And the meticulous dissection, and with judicious use of energy devices, we, sh we prefer um, diatomy hook, small chunks, repeated small chunks rather than big chunks, and a blunt dissection is used sometimes with to achieve the, uh, the safety. So energy devices, we have to use judiciously. Tonsil swabs, sometimes you don't need to have bleeding to insert a tonsil. So you know, all know that we have nice two 10 degree camera uh, ports. So if you anticipate some difficult vascular anatomy or if it is a extremely inflamed or friable area where its tendency to bleeding is high, you can still insert a tonsil swab prophylactically, I would say. And then, rather than sucking all the time and losing your pneumoperitoneum, you can use that for gentle pressure if you get a little bit of bleeding. And suction and irrigation, another technique, um, a water resection or hydro resection, and critical view of safety, as we all know, and demonstrate two longitudinal structures ending in the gallbladder. And a pulsating vessel, what happens if you see a pulsating vessel? You have to be a little bit cautious because it could well be, most likely, the right hepatic artery. So cystic artery just do not pulse that much unless if you have clipped it. The second case scenario is, uh, this is an intraoperative finding of a 63-year-old lady so you have adequate traction from the fundus towards the 10 o'clock and you have uh, good traction at the infundibular cystic junction or a Hartmann's pouch, but you don't see that important landmark that Malit described. You don't see an, a, a ruvius sulcus here. So where to start? See, these are variations of the ruvius sulcus. There's open type transverse ruvii or a closed type oblique rubia sulcus or a slit type oblique rubia sulcus. There would be many. This is a recent study, uh, a paper published in 2020 August, uh, done in Nepal. I don't know whether you can see. They, they have incorporated 230 cases after exclusion, and in 70% of their cases, this they have seen the rubias. Out of 30 percent or uh, 68 patients, after meticulous dissection, they have still seen the ruvia sulcus in 46 people. So only six did not have out of that 200. So you can dissect the adhesions, and then you may demonstrate the ruvia. In the uh, group where they did not have ruvia sulcus, they have seen some major and minor bile duct injury a little bit uh, statistically significant amount compared to the other group. So how do we safely landmark the initial dissection continued? So remember be safe. 
So in this picture, you can see the Ruvia Saga, but if you um, imagine it's not there, not only the Ruvia Saga is an important landmark, there are many other. Segment four, you can see the gall pad on, on, on your left, and you can see the, the ligament, the falciform ligament and the ligament of teres on, on your right. Between that is a segment 4S. So, uh, and the F is marked for the umbilical fissure. It's the fissure between the left lateral and left medial segments, or segment 2, 3 on the left and segment 4 on the right. And if you are lucky, you, you see the, uh, the arteries and the, the ducts through the the transparent um, peritoneum and the entry structures. So if you draw an imaginary line across the base of uh, this, this is after uh, adequate traction of the gallbladder upwards and lateral. And when you see the base of the segment four and from the bottom of the fissure, if you make an imaginary line across the basement and across the hepatodorial lug ligament, and then you can stay above that if you don't see a Ruvia sulcus. So the third scenario, a 60-year-old man with previous recurrent attacks of acute cholecystitis, once complicated with cholangitis, and CBD stone was seen on MRCP, and it was retrieved with the ERCP, and there was a plastic stent inserted. This is a picture taken from the, the Google. I don't have a... Uh, better picture, I'm sorry. Um, I hope you all have seen enough uh, dense addition of the, uh, the, the cystohepatic triangle. So it's a frozen cystohepatic triangle. How to manage this situation? Seek help. Um, you can ask for help from one of your seniors in the premises. And not only a senior, um, but a, a, a peer or maybe an assistant. So you'll be open to the comments of your assistant. And sometimes you can give a call if you're in the periphery to one of your bosses, probably a video call, and ask, what happens if you see a short, stout cystic duct? You have to be very cautious. Sometimes it is truly a short cystic duct. Sometimes it, ha it has disappeared because of the impacted large stone or uh, dense adhesion. So sometimes you can, so if you see a short, or uh, probably a stout cystic duct where you can't uh, clip it with the uh, normal metal clip, you have to be always co uh, careful that you don't clip the duct. So impacted stones can be removed from the Hartmann's pouch after making a little bit of opening and then after uh, plant dissection you may achieve um, the view of the cystic duct. So hydrodissection is important way to get, uh, go through these kind of uh, situations. And if you can't achieve that, sometimes fundus first cholecystectomy is a very good idea. You come down and then try to demonstrate um, the, the, the artery and the duct. Sometimes you may have to end up with a bailout procedure like subtotal cholecystectomy or a cholecystostomy, IOC or uh, um, use of ICG. IOC is an intraoperative cholangiogram. Uh, use of ICG I haven't mentioned here. These are not freely available in the periphery, um, only available in the expert centers. So, and the abandoning the procedure or transferring is another way out. A simple uneventful cholecystectomy is a, akin to a safe journey by airplane in the clear weather. There's no deviation from takeoff, navigation, or landing. However, when the weather is bad, such journey needs to be modified. Perhaps the flight is canceled altogether until the weather is improved, if you know it beforehand. And the pilot may decide to return to the source of origin or a flight uh, to an alternative destination. Or sometimes he may decide to fly around the bad weather and reach the destination. But the safety of all passengers is most important rather than to reach the desired destination. Thank you. 
Are there any questions uh, posted on the chat? Uh, <coughs> Prof. Alokopatiran, I think he's joining us uh, virtually. Morning, sir. Can can you hear me? Yes. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? Question: uh, If you tie uh, the right hepatic artery accidentally during surgery, what will you do? Uh, because, of course, you have done an irreversible step here. As long as it's not a bleeding, I wouldn't recommend to remove that clip or tie which can cause inadvertent bleeding and then it can obscure the entire laparoscopic view. Uh, so, so, I think you have to go ahead with the rest of the cholecystine and finish the procedure. But only thing is, liver will there will be a transient liver ischemia because 70% of the blood supply of the liver is from the portal vein, 30% by the liver. The problem is the right, uh, the bile duct is solely supplied by the hepatic artery. So if you tie the right hepatic artery, there is a risk of, there is a risk, theoretical risk of getting ischemic cholangiopathy in the right liver. Uh, but there are variant anatomy and sometimes there are cross connections from left to right in the liver so some patient, they might not even develop any ischemic cholangiopathy uh, in the future. So if it is tied already, I wouldn't recommend to uh, rectify that matter then and there that can cause inadvertent bleeding. Uh, Aloka sir, do you have any other view on that? I think what you said, I, I agree with what you said. And also you might realize that by the time you have tied the right hepatic artery, there is a very high possibility of already having caused damage to the common hepatic duct. So you need to be very careful because by the time that has happened, there is a high chance of having done more injury actually. So probably getting some senior assistance or help would be important to ex uh, make sure that there is nothing else has that nothing else has been damaged. And as Sanun said. In a laparoscopic view, if you see the vessel is pulsatile, just think twice. It may not be the cystic artery. Cystic artery usually doesn't pulsate in a laparoscopic view. If you see a pulsatile vessel, it's likely that it is a bigger vessel. Cystic artery will only pulsate once you clip and cut. You will see the pulsating stump. So if you see a vessel which is pulsating, just think twice. Call for help. And there's another question, uh, what are the available options to close the gallbladder after subtotal cholecystectomy? Uh, so now, subtotal cholecystectomy, uh, a, prop a proper subtotal cholecystectomy is uh, you remove the gallbladder, but you have to also remove the stones. If you just remove the cap of the gallbladder, leave the stones behind, the patient will still be symptomatic. And also when you remove the gallbladder, you have to retrieve the stones and then close the uh, opening of the cystic duct into the Hartman's pouch internally. So the techniques, uh, if you are still in laparoscopic technique, then you can either use a stapler if it is available, or if you are good at laparoscopic suturing, you can do laparoscopic suturing. If it is open, of course, uh, if it's laparoscopic convert to open, you can suture with uh, uh, polyglactin sutures, absorber sutures, inter. but make sure that all the impactor stones are removed. Don't leave the stones behind in the stump. Then, then the purpose will not be served. Can I add one, one more thing? Uh, yeah, like uh, Malit said, sometimes you are lucky to get a, a, a hemolock after removing the 
uh, stone impacted, but um, yeah, I have also seen this uh, endovascular stapler, but sometimes you may use an uh, endo loop like you use in a uh, laparoscopic appendicectomy, and on top of that, you can um, put a couple of stitches uh, laparoscopically. There's another question. What is the exact time window for hot cholecystectomy from the onset of pain? Uh, it's a difficult One question. more thing I would like to add about the previous question, Mali. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's uh, now. How do you ensure that there are no stones? So one thing that you can do is pass a small feeding tube into the CBD and make sure that you aspirate while so then that ensures that there is no stone in uh, in the cystic duct or in the heart and pouch. That's one thing, and also remember to always drain if you do a subtotal polycystectomy because there is a very high chance of your suture line breaking through because you've done it for difficulties. So the structure holding the sutures is also not going to be very healthy. So there's a, I have come across some many cases where there has been a late leak. So always leave a drain and watch for about two days, two or three days before removing it. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question. Uh, what is the exact time window for hot cholecystectomy from the onset of pain? Um, the literature says three to five days from the onset of symptoms, not from the admission, from the onset of symptoms, because otherwise you will consider it as hot, it, it is not hot when you go in. The advantage of doing hot is to, before the addition settings and also you, c you can use the inflammatory fluid media as a dissec dissection, uh, like it's like as if you are using hydro dissection. So three to five days is the recommendation, but uh, like to add one more thing, uh, and this is uh, acute severe called cystitis, and sometimes the degree of inflammation in the cystohepatic triangle would differentiate whether it's going to be a difficult one or not. So uh, we have seen, um, I was trained in the UK, that high CRP and WBC is associated with uh, uh, very difficult cholecystectomy and they have a more conversion rate in that. So of course, uh, after many, I mean, pool data have shown um, sometimes it's difficult to say from the onset of pain because the patient would not be that uh, precise about the date. So uh, I think uh, altogether the clinical picture, if the patient is not improving on the antibiotics, you can still try. Uh, the hot cholecystectomy, you can get away with the, the techniques Malit dis described. So, what do you think about the timing of surgery? Actually, uh, Sandhul mentioned an important point, like that is, if you are trying to do hot cholecystectomy, make sure that you can do it, and timing is also important. I, of course, don't do it after three days, but of course, literature says that you can do it at any time and probably have the same outcome. So, as Sandhul said, the white count over 11,000, maybe a high CRP and the presence of pericholecystic fluid indicates that it's going to be a difficult cholecystectomy and that the conversion rate is going to be high. So, that brings us to another important point, actually. If you are a junior, uh, if you are a trainee or a junior consultant with not much experience in lab cholecystectomy, you should really select your cases. So, there are several criteria to predict conversions and if you have a patient who has these difficult, uh, possible difficult gallbladders, make sure that you have enough time for that gallbladder or make sure that you get sufficient uh, support before you do it. And you should have a low threshold for conversion because otherwise you run into trouble. So planning is very important to prevent. And as someone's excellent example of flying an airplane, so you might not even take off if you think that the gallbladder is going to be difficult and that you don't have sufficient support with you. So you should have good equipment, good assistance, and if necessary, support. So that's a very important point, I think. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. If you accidentally cut the bile duct and bile is leaking from the cut end, do we have to clip it before sending to a specialized unit? I would say no. Just uh, make sure there is no continuous bleeding and achieve hemostasis, leave a large drain and then discuss and transfer to a specialist center. Because if you 
try to apply another clip uh, because in this, uh, especially high line injuries, for the reconstruction, we have a very narrow margin. So if you try to apply a clip and damage the lower end of the uh, cut end, then it will be a difficult reconstruction for the receiving unit. So I wouldn't recommend to apply a clip. Just leave a large strain that will prevent sepsis because if what is collected is coming out, patient will not develop go into sepsis. So I wouldn't recommend, not at all. Alok sir, do you have a different answer? If it is an open one, you can also leave a T-tube or insert a T-tube if you have one. But of course I agree without messing around anymore, best thing is to inform a specialized unit and then leave a large drain and transfer the patient uh, early. Some of these injuries are lateral injuries and they settle without any uh, serious issues. So it's not a problem, but we it's very difficult to assess at that time what sort of damage you have caused. So it's always better to uh, leave a drain and come out. Right? Sandhu, any, any other views? Yeah, I t tend to agree with uh, what you have said, sir, yeah. Because we'll be doing more, uh, more damage, probably incorporate another vascular injury if you try to clip it, so, so yes. So there's another uh, question. What are the bailout options for difficult gallbladder? I think Malit ex explained it. Uh, would you like to answer? Yeah, I think we have already discussed. Uh, you can call for help, converge to open, subtotal cholecystectomy or do nothing because patient is having a benign disease so and if it is if the anatomy is not clear just do nothing and recover the patient and then do further imaging with CTMR, CP and then discuss with the specialist center and transfer the patient so we have already discussed the answers to that question and there's another uh, I can I add something for that Sorry? In my opinion, can I add something to that? How yeah, to bail out? Not. Yeah. I think in my opinion, most of the time, you run into trouble because of your ego, actually. Not not because you don't know, not because you are inexperienced. It's the ego that uh, really keeps you going sometimes. No, I shouldn't convert. I, it's a setback for me if I stop the surgery. That should not be there. So. Every time, patient should be number one. Patient's outcome has to be the uh, utmost of utmost importance. So, if you can get out of that uh, egoistic situation where no, I have to now stop and come out. That's the most important thing because studies have shown that uh, knowledge and experience are not the most important thing. It's the risk-taking behavior of the surgeon that's also an important factor. So that that has to be realized. And I I have come out without doing anything as Sandhu explained once, just put the scope in, came out without doing anything. So patient had to have surgery later and that at the second operation, second time it was easy. So my timing was wrong. So that should not affect the outcome of the patient. That's important, I think, remember for all junior surgeons and even seniors. Thank you for highlighting that excellent point, sir. And there's another question. Uh, if the cystic duct is damaged before achieving critical view of safety, should clip it or continue or any other options? Hello, sir. It depends on how much damage you have occurred and whether there is significant spillage of bile. Because sometimes you can manage with your dissection if the spillage is very minimal, if there is no major leak. But otherwise, if you know that you can put a clip above it or and below it, you might do that, provided you are certain that there is going to be enough space. Because it, it can happen during your dissection, in the initial phase of dissection, when you are dissecting clo too close to the ball better, particularly if there has been past history of cholestitis. So it depends on actually uh, the amount, degree of spillage. Sometimes we can hold from that area instead of holding from the infundibulum so that you are covering if it is particularly close to the infundibulum. But uh, it's not a major problem actually because the amount of leakage of bile is not going to be very significant with a small cystic duct uh, damage. And if you uh, stick to that principle of getting only small chunks of tissue at any point of time, you are unlikely to be causing a 
major injury at in any point so that's not a significant problem most of the time yeah so provided you know that it is a cystic duct if you if you are not sure about the anatomy then same yeah, pr yeah, same yeah, principle yeah. just leave a large train discuss and transfer I'll add one more thing. So, uh, as Malik said, if you are uh, quite sure about the cystic duct, yes. But um, if you have uh, adhered to all the safety precautions and if you make a hole in the cystic duct, uh, if you have not already dissected the artery, then keep a small swab there, dissect the artery, clip and cut. Because if you avulse the artery, it will uh, cause hemorrhage and uh, will lead to problems. So clip the artery, cut it, and then um, safely dissect down and probably get a clip. There are a couple of questions. Uh, there's another question, management of missed drop st uh, stones inside the peritoneal cavity. Alak sir, do you have any experience? I mean, if you if you've noticed that it is dropped out, you, have to, you should try and retrieve it then and there. He's asking about uh, missed drop stones probably they will present as abscesses, I would say. Yes, we must somehow try and take everything out. So if the trick here is the moment you see stones dropping, you have to be very careful. I mean, rather than allowing everything to be uncontrollable. So we have to be in control of the situation all the time. So maybe start using a bag or in converting it to open because actually if you have a huge amount of stones drop then obviously the risk of having weight complications are high so it's not difficult sometimes to find these stones particularly with some irrigation but if you are in view of the area and if you uh, carefully search it's very likely that you find them so try to be in control of the situation if you lose control then maybe do a mini laparotomy or whatever it all depends on the risks and the benefits to the patient. So, don't hesitate to open to uh, improve the quality of life for the patient. That's very really important because I know that uh, some most patients, if you do a mini, mini polycystectomy incision you do for your conversion, they still can go home the next day. I mean, it doesn't mean that their hospital stay is going to be long and pain is not that great. So. Conversion is not a huge issue, so you should not uh, hesitate to convert if you think that patient is going to be better off with your conversion. And conversion is not a failure of management, I think it is standard accepted, it is not a failure. Yeah. Um, Some centers say that you have to have a certain degree of conversion, certain rate of conversion to show that you are actually a safe surgeon, just like uh, appendicitis there should be a some degree of negative appendicectomies to show that you have your appendicectomies are correct that was one uh, theory that was there those days similarly same thing applies for polycystectomy as well uh, there's another question how to manage continuous bleeding from the cystic plate so uh, if you have dissected in the right plane it's uh, very unlikely that it's a major bleed from the liver so uh, so, uh, first, uh, if there's bleeding, uh, get a, get a sound swab and apply compression, get the sucker ready and irrigate and see where it is bleeding from. If you see, can, if you can see a, a strand of vessels, then of course you can uh, clip those vessels. But if it's coming from the surface, then uh, we can use uh, diatomy with a uh, spray mode, in the spray mode and apply and then again you can keep some uh, 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 the local hemostatic agents like Surgicel. But if it's a continuous bleeding from bleeding point, if you are good at laparoscopic suturing, you can suture. Uh, otherwise, if it's still bleeding, of course, you need to again convert. Hello, sir. Actually, bleeding from the cystic plate uh, is usually not a major problem. Yes. As you said, uh, you should be able to mostly manage it either pressure or uh, diatomy. And as you said, spray diatomy is effective because the liver, as we know, even if it's injured, fractured, the bleeding settles after some time. 
and you can use also surgery cell which is uh, which will act as hemostatic agent but i've really seen one or two cases where the where hepatic venous tributaries have been damaged and those ones are difficult to control but even then uh, you have to try and apply pressure for some time if you if it doesn't work open and then uh, manage it as a open procedure so that sh that shouldn't happen in the first place but if it does happen same principles of hemostasis which applies to any other surgery so will you uh, reduce the hemoperitoneum and look for further bleeding because with the hemoperitoneum uh, the yeah. bleeding can be obscured isn't it yeah yeah you have a point i think yes yeah. particularly venous bleeding venous bleeding um i think uh, we don't have any other questions posted here and i think we have only 7 minutes remaining anyway are also anything else to add a salient points uh, to take home message for really special trainees sum summarize to summarize i think i have just thought about a few important points that is always try and hug the goal better stay close to the goal better then you are unlikely to make a mistake and take a break to appreciate the normal anatomy from time to time because even if everything is seems to go well you might be in the wrong plane you might have illusions as mal expansion so always take a break to appreciate the normal anatomy and ch small chunks when you are dissecting and then another point i don't just mentioned or not when you are applying a clip across the cystic duct for the supposed cystic duct try to apply the 8300 or the ordinary clip and if it does not uh, fit if it is too small then you have to really think whether you are really going to clip the cystic duct or not so before you apply always make sure number 3 ego and call for help at any time or convert or even stop so even if you open hugging the call better principle is important now i have seen people convert and then cause bile duct injuries so again don't deviate from the gall bladder so my principle is i go into the gall bladder and put one finger inside the gall bladder so that i know that i am within the gall bladder and i leave as much of gall bladder tissue as possible on the uh, liver or the mid and supramedial surface and dissect inferiorly and uh, finish the operation with the subtotal colds so those are the i think important points that we need to remember all the time however experienced you are however junior you are it doesn't matter because all the injuries i have seen occurring mostly with with experience so experienced surgeons are no different to inexperienced junior surgeons when it comes to all the injuries as i mentioned earlier the errors or the mistakes are not necessarily due to inexperience and That's, also uh, be open for suggestions and comments from the assistant isn't it Yeah, good assistant is one of the best uh, yes. things exactly. that you can have. Luxury is in surgery. Yeah. Talking assistant, not too much, but <laughs> critically, I mean, criti critical assistant who will not hesitate to say, uh, "Is it is it the system yeah. duct?" Like uh, who is always on the lookout for problems. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, i think uh, we can wind up the session so thank you uh, uh, president and the council uh, for inviting us to do this uh, breakfast session thank you thank you very much dr malik nan sena sandun mulat singhala and professor aloka patirana uh, if we move on to the plenary lecture number 13 embarking on laparoscopic whipple procedure first hand experience i had the pleasure of inviting professor mohan de silva and professor bhavanth gamage onto this stage to chair the session a very good morning to all of you good morning professor palnevelu we bring you greetings from sri lanka and it is my honor and great privilege to introduce professor palanivelu whom i have known for few decades now to this audience 
spread throughout the world. In my opinion, Professor Palanuelo is one of the few, if not the best laparoscopic hand in the world. And it's no small statement. He is a world renowned laparoscopic surgeon, undoubtedly. And he's received and recognized and been awarded with numerous global awards with many titles, out of which one really impressed me is a title given to him by the New York City Council. He was awarded the title of Living Legend of Laparoscopic Surgery. Of his numerous local awards, B.C. Roy National Award from the President of India stands out tall. He said a massive contribution to training of laparoscopic surgeons, not only in India, but throughout the world, including our country, Sri Lanka. And apart from his <clears throat> imparting his knowledge and skills in laparoscopic surgery with many global workshops he has organized in India and participated abroad, he's uh, written numerous books in the field and he's been recognized highly all over the world. Palani Velu is the past president of the Association of Surgeons of India. He's a past president and the founder president of the Association of Minimal Access Surgeons of India. And he's a past president of the Indian Association of the Indian Society of the Diseases of the Esophagus and the Stomach. He's also the managing trustee of the Jim Hospital in Coimbatore, one of the most sought after laparoscopic surgery hospitals for training uh, for trainee surgeons and <clears throat> people from all over the world visit this hospital because of the excellent uh, human resources he has developed by himself and to imparting this knowledge on the others. <clears throat> on a personal note, I must say that his unbelievable laparoscopic talent and the surgical talent <clears throat> is shined, this is what my observation is, really shined by his so humble personality. It's very few people in the world who's reached that dizzy heights can be so humble. And I always admired Professor Palanivelu for his simple, humble personality. Today he's going to show us the master craft of laparoscopic surgery and by talking about performing a surgery which is globally recognized as the mother of all surgeries, the Whipple's operation. Over to you, Professor Palanuelo. Good morning, friends. I thank the President and the Council members of Sri Lankan College for giving this opportunity to talk to you on laparoscopic pancreatoidectomy. This comes from Gem Hospital, Coimbatore and uh, Chennai. And uh, Whipple operation, you all know, even open it is considered some of the most complex operation. When we went to minimal invasive surgery, and initially, a lot of uh, concern was about to talk about the facility, uh, feasibility, then it's acceptable, then we have to prove non-inferior to open operation, then advantages, when we do a new procedure, should be better than the existing procedure. Finally, it should be standard of care. So now we have all these stages we crossed. Now we are, uh, we can boldly say that minimal invasive pancreatoidectomy is the standard of care in the selected centers, eye volume centers. Why we need laparoscopic surgery? It is patient recovers faster, short term advantages exist more. The quality of imaging is better in a minimal invasive approach to perform a resection and of course the most complex reconstruction, both open laparoscopic, it is difficult. Immune system is unaffected, that's why long term results likely to be better. And also some of the cancers we can stage them, accordingly we can treat chemo, then subsequently can take it also. So unnecessary laparotomy we can avoid. So quality of life, both immediate after surgery and later also is better. 
No touch technique is one thing is in pancreas very important to prevent extrusion of cancer cells. You can see the GDA, IPDA, what can be controlled before resection of the pancreas. This article, no touch technique, has been talked about long time. So the more concern is who should do it, where, where are the facilities of a center that can be done, and indication of surgery, whom that patients and a PD can be done. Also, how the technique can be adapted to remove that cancer without uh, affecting the oncological safety. And this is the first webpool operation. I did it in 98. Before that, Michel Gagnier said it is uh, takes longer time, complication more, and uh, no benefit. And he said and, uh, during um, Sage's meeting and flooding, he said he stopped doing it. That made me to come and do it, uh, total laparoscopy, including pancreatology, genastomy, anastomosis. And uh, this was the patient, the minute after marriage, you got operated, and uh, ma after marriage, developed a jaundice, found to have a carcinoma pancreas, and we operated. Now, this is subsequently, every year is coming now, 22 years past, he is uh, healthy. So, initially, there was uh, no, lot of concern was there. Slowly, slowly, now you can appreciate since 2010 onwards, we can change approach, you know, people acceptability they increased. And we developed a standardized technique to enhance the curability. For example, everybody thought that exposure to pancreas and because of retroprotonal location will be limited. It is not so, which I am going to show video. Our first approach is enhances the radicality, which also can be done, minimally use approach, all the types. And mesopancreal duodenum can be excised from SMA very clearly and because of magnification, control vessels better, bleeding less. And also we have developed our own dynamic traction technique for during ancillary excision. All safely can be done. At the end now, studies have shown the number of nodes and radicality is better than open. You can appreciate here and uh, that uh, vein, ancillate vein which drains into the, we can be divided to approach ancillate. Also, the SMA artery, which is related to posterior left side, can be made to right side, which I will be showing it. And the steps of operation has been defined. You know? These are the steps, exposure, mobilization, which I am going to show in video, step by step that I will show. It is like any other standard procedure. It is not that uh, originally I thought too complex operation. Yes, still too complex, but because of standardization, it can be done step by step properly and um, almost without conversion, one can do without bleeding or proper reconstruct technique. See, there are the ports. Lot of initially, it, you know, some port placement slowly, slowly change. Now, almost over 1,000 cases, we are done and we are able to standardize our ports. And uh, that epigastric, and you can see, these are the not uh, trocars. It is only a sling, stitches, falsum ligament and the gallbladder traction. So, uh, so hepatic. Camera, you can see the right of the umbilicus. This right hand uh, 12 mm trocar, sapling, sutures, taking everything possible. And this is uh, left hand, and here also, uh, steps depending on the stage, one can move from left side or between the leg to doing it. This is a position we can appreciate, team setup. And uh, you can see this type of uh, uh, falsum ligament traction and gallbladder traction. So, without any trocar, we have a good subhepatic exposure, which is very difficult to even get in open. Eh? Even if you want to have a left lobe liver traction like in bariatric surgery, one can do lift up. This particular case not necessary. I was showing in a live surgery demonstration, so I showed them how to be done. And uh, see now, I am going to step by step how to show. See the stomach traction, gastrocolicomentum in size, and um, so after incision, we go to the uh, transverse colon. The trans hepatic flexion, transverse colon has to mobilize well down. And so, so we can approach the second part, third part of the duodenum to proceed for the caucus maneuver. See, now we are able to see, look at, I am working on the side of the second part of the duodenum. In IVC, you are able to look at and we go caucus maneuver. In fact, it is extended caucus maneuver. We approach celiac axis and the, uh, and the SMA and we are able to do here, look at, you can see the SMA here, down, above celiac axis, even the nodal sampling can be done very effectively without any uh, problem. That kind of uh, camera system, open you cannot put our hand, whatever direction we change, not possible. See now, and uh, assessment receptability of the SMB and uh, portal vein, you can control gastrocolic vein and uh, we can approach, see, 
and here it is feasible that way it is also can be done. Say now again control of gastric duodenal artery look at uh, now we dissect and uh, we divide the duodenum or uh, classical depending on what type of procedure what we perform and uh, see we divide the duodenum and the gastro duodenal artery and complete clearance can be done periportal clearance and uh, this is a hemolog clip is the ideal way in order to prevent a trauma to the vessel so post operative bleeding pseudoaneurysm is no more and uh, by using this uh, clip now we can see dissecting the common bile duct we can go and divide and uh, to prevent the spillage we can even uh, uh, put a bulldog clamp to control it and uh, see like this and we work on the portal vein and clear so you can appreciate the clearance will be like a complete you know there is no uh, leaving it you know, complete see this is a common hepatic artery towards the celiac axis and uh, the most important is uh, the undilated ductal system difficult to identify during surgery even open but here uh, this is my own way of doing it put a uh, cotton tape ligature and uh, that duct get distended then during the division we are able to identify one is because of magnification, second of a distension of the duct. This is a hemostatic suture, but we place mainly for handling and you know, don't want to pancreas, soft pancreas, trauma. For that we can avoid by putting uh, this type of sutures. So two sutures, an upper and an inferior border. Eh? Then we are dividing it, use a harmonic. Now as we go closer to the duct, no energy source, eh? that time only split the tissues they take a sharp scissor cutting it so that duct almost last five years I have not done any uh, problem in identifying a duct we are able to see the pancreatic duct using this uh, technique and uh, safer even a two millimeter three millimeter systems and the most important is artery first approach GDA and IPDA also first jejunal artery if a tumor is instead of uncinate even first jejunal artery can be taken and SMA clearance can be done very well eh? that is way it is possible. Now look at this and I am taking the duodenum to the right side that uncinate vein which I told we divide it and we make a mesentery division. We divide this mesentery to the right of the pedicle and look at here see now so then we divide it and uh, then we can approach to the uncinate excision I will be showing now. Um, see now you can see and uh, working at the SMA margin because of the traction SMA is instead of to the left side it comes to the right of the SMB and uh, carefully. So see you can appreciate I am pushing the uh, port SMB and the portal way to the left side. Now you can see the SMB so nicely and anatomy itself is changed because of my dynamic traction technique. So now you can see slowly, slowly anterior to the SMB, then lateral, then posterior. During this time, IPDA artery will come. You can you have to clip and you can see. Now I'm showing it here. So now this is superior pancreatic vein, and we clip it divide. This patient has got a replaced hepatic artery, abnormal. So that also must be carefully. Uh, preserved. Now you can see that is replaced artery and um, and clear completely here. You look at and this way it is can be done. Uh, as, now you can see this SMB, uh, IVC, this is a left renal vein, this is SMA. Eh? Now you can see clearance is like a uh, open. And uh, this is uh, my own technique called uh, dynamic traction using a rubber band applying to the divided onto the pancreas and also to the jejunum. So this, this side, this when you give a traction to this and it, it retracts anterior laterally so that approach to it both anterior and posterior to this can be done very well so that bloodlet dissection can be done which I will be showing see the traction of the ancinate and here this is a now. So you can appreciate this is a very very good technique and uh, but that is possible see now you can look at both anterior posterior the ancinate one can dissect it well. In a reconstruction also is we can do it a modified Blumka technique. I found it is very, uh, very well and uh, see, and we use uh, initially it is a 2-0 subsequently duct to mucosanastomosis and now you can look at this modified 
through and through pancreas, seromuscular, back to posterior to anterior of the pan pancreas, then seromuscular and uh, tying it. Now we look at I'm making an enterotomy, small hole and uh, according to the diameter of the pancreatic duct, this particular case undilated duct system, I use a five French size a pediatric phenic tubes. So now look at, this is a technique I learned from Chinese, it is a continuous duct uh, mucosa suturing and here we, we found a leak almost in nil, last and more 150 cases, I had a grade two, three, a few cases only and no problem and the recovery is so good and uh, very nice. And uh, interrupted suture is a trauma to the duct more, that is the leak rate is little more. And magnification helps us to do make it a suturing very well now. See again same similar technique there. And uh, then anastomosis you know, it can be done well, it is the usual way. And uh, now duodenum this also can be done. So now, and uh, see I am showing a robotic technique, this also sling technique uh, it has been done. And now look at here, caucus, extended caucus maneuver. I am using harmonic, robotic harmonic. Left hand is a bipolar instrument, you can look at. And uh, clarity, 3D, everything is very good. Now you can see the duct, uh, uh, gastrocolic trunk with clip and dividing it. See there is a gastrocolic trunk with a clips, dividing it. While seeing it 3D, it gives a different view. Eh? Of course, do even a laparoscopy nowadays we do with the 3D laparoscope only. So, 3D vision is uh, very good for pancreating. See now, uh, anteriorly we dissect. See now, and same way now, I, duct, uh, I told you, same way you can do it. Now, you can see posteriorly also. And finally, they take it up like laparoscopy here also and uh, take the loop to the side and the anastomosis technique also see look at magnified and so well we can do it here hmm? and put a duct you know this and uh, duct mucosa it is, uh, helps you a lot and that's why the robotic uh, reconstruction in undilated duct system is very effective in case of robotic system and reconstruction exactly the same eh? this is a bile duct anastomosis okay so, the problem what we learned in the beginning, the proper indication, instrumentation technique is not known, not possible. That's why 2014 at Korea, during World Congress, and um, we have finalized to go for uh, making guidelines, and I, I was the made the convener to do it. So, first entrance summit was held at Coimbatore, and uh, all faculties, experts came from all over the world, and we had the first laparoscopic pancreatic resection submit, and these guidelines got published in surgical oncology as a Coimbatore guidelines. I am very happy about it. There we described indication, case selection, resection technique, reconstruction technique, pre outcomes, and training how it should go about. And uh, this is uh, described. Any beginners want to do it, there. this is a good guidelines. But same time, first RCT between open and laparoscopy was done at Coimbatore and Gem Hospital and that got published in British Journal of Surgery as quoted one of the best articles in the recent past. So, even their comparison between, you know, excision of the encinate mesopancreatic clearance is uh, because of magnification, bloodless dissection and uh, very well can be done and uh, proved. And those days you all know morbidity is very high, mortality also very more than 5 percent and the fistula rate 10 to 15 per more, not less than 10 percent, no, those days. Now laparoscopy made it and it is a benchmark. We could achieve in two th on our study and it is a mortality 2 percent less and 20 percent 5 year survival. Now recently I can quote in RO resection cases the 5 year survival is 80 percent. So, it was dangerous operation or poor prognosis now, it has been shown this also can be treated very well effectively. So, initial hurdles you know, because of Michel Gagne's presentation made it lot of concern, but my presentation 2000 at um, Atlanta it was well received and subsequently we are able to show different congresses and it is becoming a, now has become a standardized. So, lot of articles came at the beginning and slowly and I started accepting, you know, later. And our journey, if you look at, starts with first after uh, Sage's presentation and we published our first series of 42 cases in JAX. And uh, something I was invited by um, Takada uh, to publish, you know, our articles, evolution technique in the journal. 
and again we published again January last in 2015. So, port vein reconstruction also can be done like open and can reconstruct without increasing mortality and good survival. So, everything is now technology is making a difference. So, here selection criteria we took it in the initial periambular tumors, the smaller size that is why we are able to achieve good results and that we published again you know, in this one. So, later number of lymph nodes and everything we studied it is not inferior to open and slowly, slowly then it is shown number of nodes better. So, decreased blood loss, short length of hospital stay, reduced pain and functionally recovery is better. And invasive abnormal procedure is less pain, short hospital, that is most important thing. If a open surgery, pancreatic leaks, the morbidity is going to be very high, that is very important here. But lot of three studies came and this also plots the trial is RCT now we will go. And this study has shown and uh, definitely longer progress of free survival. That is the most important thing that we need. Number of lymph higher and RO resection rate lower in. That means RO resection we have achieved more. This is a Korean study to experience. Initially it takes longer time, no doubt. Learning curve, no? One third, if he is in 100 cases, he said first 33, second 33, third. And he has said he is standardized. Now he has completed 500 cases. And he is very happy to do laparoscopic more than open. So, see, initially there was reluctance. Only 285 cases till 2011. Now, it is completely changed. Even every year we have a very series of. We publish our portal intersection also. And that also can be done because of this. And Kendrick has done the large series. Now, many centers, particularly robotic portal reconstruction, they do very well. No? And um, so, robotic approach has shown and undialed section of reconstruction better, conversion is less, even bleeding is less. So, that is one and but not necessarily to go only robotic. If uh, not there, laparoscopy also very highly can be done without uh, safety, but it is a uh, little difficult to perform reconstruction. So, our first approach is also open. It is become a popular. Similarly, we can adapt it. We presented our own. So, I take this opportunity to thank uh, um, this and uh, as we cannot say that initial series, you know, longer time, bleeding, complications are all, but slowly when we learn the technique. Now, the technique has been standardized well. When I admit the first time, I did not know how long it will take. I took 11 hours to a people first time. Subsequently, within few cases, I am able to reduce it significantly. Now, so many live workshops have demonstrated Whipple operation, both laparoscopy and robotic. It is between average and four, four to five hours time we are able to perform and every conference when we showed it will was appreciated well. But the surgeons who are doing extensively in robotic Whipple alone, for example, Liu Rong in China and uh, he has done the largest here in the world, his operating time is less than three hours. And so it is all in the hand of surgeons who does it and what type of cases they choose, what technology adapts, that is the way it is. I think it is safer procedure, it can be done practice well. So, I think I take this opportunity, wish all the Sri Lankan surgeons and all the best for successful Congress and uh, I wish, I always enjoy to come Sri Lanka. This is the first time I am not able to make it because of uh, Corona, I feel uh, this, uh, but still I wish all of you and soon we will meet in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Palani Velu. Uh, actually, sir, I hope you are online with us. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was about to talk live. Yeah. And yesterday evening, I sent the video, recorded one, played. Anyway, I'm happy about it. Thank you and very much, sir. I could show the light. Yeah. Actually, on a personal note, sir, I have, for all our juniors, uh, I have seen uh, live uh, laparoscopic uh, weepers skin to skin, four and a half hours done by him. So, it is, it is not an exaggeration what he says. And for all our uh, junior uh, surgeons, uh, as uh, Association of Laparoscopic and Minimal Access and Digital Surgeons of Sri Lanka, our council decided to select this topic uh, specifically to encourage our young surgeons to embark on laparoscopic people's procedure. And uh, this is the person to get advice and guidance. And his book, uh, Laparoscopic Surgery, uh, with two volumes, I have purchased it in 2005 at Gem Hospital in your Laparosurge uh, conference. And still I refer 
uh, that book before uh, any uh, major laparoscopic procedures. So to all Sri Lankan young surgeons, we sh I think we should, what you should read is this type of textbooks written by uh, experts. And uh, Prof. Mohan uh, quite correctly said he's a legend, uh, living legend of laparoscopic surgery. He has devised many, improvised many devices that can be used in this part of the world uh, when we do laparoscopic procedures. One thing is uh, cardiomyotomy scissor. He has devised a fantastic scissor where we can uh, split the esophageal musculature without damaging the mucosa. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, uh, it is a great pleasure to have you this morning to uh, enlighten on this uh, procedure to all our surgeons. On behalf of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka in this Golden Jubilee uh, uh, conference, uh, let me again thank you uh, for you for this uh, excellent presentation. Any comments, sir? We have three, four minutes left. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Mohan. And uh, this, I think, uh, uh, the word of appreciation mode. Right, two, two things, you know, the pancreatic cancer uh, and by training any one youngsters can take up. Now, we, this year, the Surgical Oncology Society of India and we are jointly making a few programs Train only in pancreatic resection. Any sir, surgical surgeon joining us, very happy. Second thing, we started a training center called MASTI Chennai, Minimal Access Surgery Training Institute at Chennai. And every week, 15 days, one some program will be there. I think, and when associated with the Srirangan College, and a lot of uh, youngsters can come get opportunity to train. Very nice. Any questions? Any from from delegates or any one of you? I'll be happy to share this now. I can see uh, young hepatobiliary surgeons in the audience. Any questions? We have actually five minutes more. Like later. And uh, uh, you said the two volumes, that is old book, uh, 2005. Yes. Now, three, two years over, we have come with the four volumes. Two become a four. It got released in 2018, 19. And uh, so I think... Uh, I'll, JP is a publisher and you can contact and that is uh, with the more illustrations, photographs, step-by-step -step description of operation, all has been described. And it is volume, colorectal, one, HBB1, one, upper GI1, general, no? like this, I split into four volumes. And uh, I think uh, uh, our yes, young surgeons should look at that. It is uh, complete information is there in that book. So pancreatic cancer is a question is very difficult to ask by the answers unless get into it. Eh? Yeah. In the absence of any questions, uh, let me again thank. Thank you very much, sir. Hope uh, we will meet yeah. in person in future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, today we are, our Congress is going on and Delhi, I'm in Delhi. I'm talking from the auditorium only now. And I must see conference. I'm missing many of this Sri Lankan surgeon because of Overlapping, I did not know that dates. You know, we should have gap, we should have some gap. Would have been you know, more beneficial. And uh, all three days, yesterday, today, tomorrow is going live surgeries. And from Jam Hospital, Chennai, Coimbatore, and Aurangabad, it is first time in the history we are transmitting 4K without loss. And uh, one can see in the, anywhere in the world and the interaction without loss of time. And uh, when you have any time, any time during this time you are free, you can connect and see. Morning between 10 and 3 o'clock live operation, 3 to 8 is the deliberations. Okay, thank you very much. I, I always look for and uh, meet physically either in India or in Sri Lanka. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my president Abhay Dalvi was in your Congress and he is flying today morning to come here. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Very nice. Uh, we'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mohan De Silva and Professor Bhavantangama Um We move on to the next plenary lecture. Uh, Preoperative workup of hyla cholangiocarcinoma. To chair the session, let me invite Professor Rohan Sirivardhana and Dr. S.S. Jamis onto the stage.
morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to the second uh, plenary lecture. The lecture is on uh, pre-operative workup of uh, high local angiocarcinoma. It is one of the most uh, demanding hepatobiliary surgeries to perform and it's important to select the right patient uh, for this surgery. So uh, to, to enlighten us on this uh, demanding topic, we have uh, Mr. Hassan Malik. He's a consultant HPB surgeon and to University Hospital, Liverpool from United Kingdom. Over to you, uh, Mr. Hassan Malik. I would invite to uh, your um, uh, Golden Jubilee uh, meeting. Uh, my name is Hassan Malik. I'm a liver surgeon and a surgical oncologist uh, from the UK. I'm going to focus today on an update on the management of cholangiocarcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma is a rare cancer. It's less than 10% of all primary liver tumours. It's a tumour that is most commonly found in the perihilar uh, region or uh, the classical clap skin type tumour. It's a disease of the elderly and it's a deadly type of tumour. There's a number of etiological risk factors. The commonest globally is liver fluke found mainly in the Far East. But in the vast majority of cases, there are unknown genetic and environmental factors. There's a number of diagnostic tools that we have at hand. Uh, one of the more interesting ones is the role of the spyglass or the cholecystoscopy uh, through ERCP, and this allows uh, tissue acquisition with uh, excellent accuracy uh, to help plan uh, uh, surgery. In terms of intrahepatic tumours, there's a number of different histological subtypes. They often present as a large firm mass within the liver. This is a, a, a old paper or an important paper from Japan uh, showing a number of resected cases. And crucially, what they found is that if you had intrahepatic metastases and the presence of extrahepatic nodal disease, there was no benefit from surgery. And in addition, we traditionally do not undertake lymphadenectomy for these tumours. However, this is recently being challenged. Most of these tumours require a simple liver section, but occasionally you need to undertake complex uh, hepatectomies for large tumours like this, which was involved in the IVC requiring a, a Dacron graft for the CAVA. And in Liverpool, we've performed over 40 IVC resections. The majority of my talk now will now focus on perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. There's a number of challenges for the surgeon here, understanding the hilar anatomy, assessing the extent of tumour, management of a jaundiced patient, the technical demands of surgery, the role of adjuvant or neadjuvant therapies, and often we have an analytic approach to this disease and the rest. In terms of the hilar anatomy, you need to understand the biliary drainage of the caudate, the movement of the portal vein in the hilum of the liver, relationship of the portal vein to the bile ducts and the hepatic arteries, aberrant um, biliary drainage to the liver and accessory or replaced arteries. Uh, this schematic shows that the, that the caudate lobe has a variable drainage uh, into the bile ducts and essentially you have to remove the caudate lobe on block for uh, achieving an R or not resection in perihilar cholangiocarcinoma surgery. Again, understanding the left portal vein in the umbilical fissure is an important uh, landmark for perihilar cholangiocarcinoma surgery and its relationship to the other structures at that site. Again, the bile duct has a number of different anatomical variations and this will again impact uh, your surgery. And similarly, with regards to the hepatic arteries and crucially, uh, the replaced right hepatic artery from the SMA. In terms of local regional assessment, this is either with uh, PTC or ERCP. This allows you to drain uh, the liver. In addition, we use MR and CT. There's a question mark or stage in laparoscopy, but certainly in our centre, we use this in all cases to exclude the presence of perineal disease prior to a planned resection. Comparing perioperative management with regards to management of the jaundice in the UK, this depends on local expertise and is an equipoise between ERCP and PTC usage. In Japan and the Far East, traditionally, it has been uh, PTC. There is controversy over the role of metal stents. We certainly use metal stents in operable cases. The Dutch uh, drainage trial compared PTC to ERCP and had to be closed early due to increased morbidity in the PTC arm. In terms of tumour valuation at a local level, you can use CT, 
or MR, and in terms of portal vein embolization to grow the future remnant liver. In the UK, we tend to reserve this for patients requiring an extended hepatectomy, but in the Far East, traditionally, it has been for patients who require a greater than 50% liver resection. These are the contraindications to surgery, which are self-explanatory. And in terms of the operation itself, while you read this, this is a long and complex operation that takes up to 12 hours to undertake and has significant morbidity. But if you're able to resect uh, the tumour, this gives you the best long-term patient survival and outcomes. In terms of improving disease control, this is usually either by more being more radical with our uh, resection, vascular reconstructions and lymphadenectomy. In terms of more radical surgery, um, as the tumour grows either from the left lobe down towards the right or in the converse uh, direction, you will go from a standard hemihepatectomy to an extended resection. In terms of negative margins, um, if we are able to achieve a resection with a negative margin, then this gives us the best uh, patient outcome. And as already mentioned, corded lobe resection is crucial to this. The note touch technique has been uh, popularized by Peter Nauhaus's group, and this is an, a planned on block resection of the portal vein, even if it is involved or not. This paper from their group suggested that the no touch technique was beneficial when compared to a traditional approach. However, there are certain limitations with this paper. It's a retrospective series over a long period of time, and both groups had an on or a section. The, sur the survival difference is unlikely due, due to be a local technique. Uh, in terms of vascular resections reconstructions, this is a patient of mine who required a portal vein resection reconstruction. Approximately 30% of our patients do require vascular resections. This meta-analysis did show that patients who required a vascular resection did have poorer outcomes. However, at an individual patient level, and as you can see from this data from Japan, it is worthwhile pursuing. But the majority of these patients had a venous resection. When you look at arterial resections, these invariably are associated with far worse uh, survival. And in our unit, that would be deemed as a contraindication to resection. Lymphadenectomy. This is a schematic of the upper abdominal lymph nodes. And this is the type of dissection that we would expect the portal vein and the hepatic artery are sclerotized from the pancreas to the liver. In terms of defining resectability, the Memorial Sloan Kettering group have proposed a local T stage, and we have uh, validated this in our series. But in addition, uh, we've identified that left hepatic artery involvement is an additional independent uh, uh, factor in terms of resectability. Now, when you traditionally talk about resectability for perihelar tumours, you, you uh, define the bismuth classification and bismuth four tumours are traditionally deemed to be a resectable, but even in those cases, you can undertake an extended resection. The only uh, unresectable tumours are when you cannot reconstruct the vascular inflow to the future remnant liver. In terms of prognosis following the resection, there are a number of prognostic factors which have been validated by this combined series from Sloan Kettering and the Amsterdam Medical Centre. We have subsequently undertaken a meta-analysis and have validated those factors. But in addition, there were uh, two further factors that were uh, significant in terms of prognosis. Now, one important concept in modern surgery is enhanced recovery. And this is a multi-step process with four key elements. These are improved perioptive assessment, reducing the physiological stress of surgery, improving perioptive management, early mobilization and discharge. ERAS has a number of components. The vast majority of these are not controlled by the surgeon. It's actually the extended clinical team that is crucial to delivering this. Now, all ERA series invariably exclude perihalar cholangiocarcinoma. We have undertaken 98 resections for perihalar cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, all patients were managed within an established ERAS program. These patients all have had preoperative cardiopulmonary exercise testing, ability drainage, optimization of nutrition, medical comorbidities, and anemia. 
intraoperatively we undertake goal directed therapy. These patients all go back to our high dependency ward. We provide an extended uh, course of antibiotics. These patients often have multiple bacteria within their bile, and it's crucial to take bile swabs intraoperatively. And then your antibiotic treatment is guided by this. They will all have epidural anesthesia and they will be mobilized early. When we looked at our outcomes, our mortality was 12%. This is consistent with other um, uh, large series, as is our long-term survival. However, the median length of stay for these patients was 11 days compared to six days for a patient who's had a resection of colorectal liver metastases. They all invariably have complications. The vast majority of these occur within the first three years, and they're grouped into two stages. The early complications are liver failure and sepsis. The late complications is often biliary complications. Now, moving on to liver transplantation. So the Mayo series uh, um, has uh, popularized the role of liver transplantation in cholangia carcinoma, and this was initially in patients with PSC. And the intention to treat survival of this group was 53%. About 30% of those patients never had any proven evidence of malignancy. Subsequent meta-analysis has compared transplantation to resection. It's a mixture of patients with PSC and de novo carcinoma, and what they found was an improved R0 resection rate with transplantation compared to resection, reduced morbidity. However, there was no significant difference in survival between the two modalities. Now, this more recent paper has challenged the role of surgery uh, uh, compared to transplantation. So these are patients with non-PSC proven carcinoma and small early tumours, less than three centimetres, no negative tumours. And they found that 54% five year survival with transplantation versus resection. However, the outcomes for the patients who were resected at 29% five year survival seems quite low. And when you look at the series in detail, each centre which undertook resections undertook less than four resections per year. Their overall five year survival for cholangia carcinoma resection was 18%, which is far. Uh, less optimal than we would expect in, in Europe. And we also know that surgery from high volume centres is associated with improved survival. So are we comparing apples with oranges? And we looked at uh, our data in Liverpool. I've already mentioned our five year survival. 17 patients would have been transplanted if that was available in the UK. Our actuarial survival for those patients was actually sitting at 82%. There is the French transfill study, which is comparing resectable uh, tumours who are being randomised to uh, resection versus transplantation, and we are awaiting the results of that trial. Now, to wrap things up, um, what factors do we consider when planning surgery? Well, clearly resectability. The problem is, uh, you know, you put 10 uh, liver surgeons in a room, you'll get 12 different answers for this. This is based on you as an individual surgeon deciding what can be done in your hands. But as surgical oncologists, it's also important to understand the reasoning behind undertaking an operation and the prognostic factors, because ultimately you want to provide a patient a chance for a cure. But in addition, it's important to understand the comorbidities of the patients and your own outcomes. And the, I, you know, you can see me talking about this surgery, but what is the outcome of this operation in your hands, in your institution, with your team? And then you can risk stratify patients. And any cholangia carcinoma surgery is at the high end uh, risk of this uh, risk spectrum here. So in conclusion, cholangia carcinoma is an aggressive disease. Radical resection in a selected group of patients can achieve five survivals. There is the importance of lymphadenectomy and caudate resection in perihalar cholangia carcinoma. I would propose that the role of transplantation is currently unproven in non-PSC resectable cholangia carcinoma patients. I'd like to thank you for your uh, uh, time and kind invite uh, to this meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Hassan Malik, for joining us from Liverpool, United Kingdom. You an update on these uh, pre overcops of hyalocholangioma carcinoma. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rohan Sirvardhan and Dr. S.S. Jamils. We move on to the next plenary lecture for today. Uh, 
pancreatic necrosectomy when and how to chair this session let me invite dr arinda dharmapala and dr malit nandasena onto the podium onto the stage right so we are on the third plenary for the day and it's uh, plenary 14b uh, it's it's uh, going to be a uh, on an important topic, pancreatic necrosectomy, when and how, right? So actually at one point we were, uh, surgeons, we were just moving away from necrosectomy because it brought out uh, uh, very high mor morbidity and mortality. But uh, now uh, with correct timing and uh, uh, with uh, correct timing and correct techniques, I think we are getting good results. So we are, we are uh, even though it's a complex uh, situation where there are a lot of complexities and uh, dilemmas on the management, uh, I think it's a, it's a very prudent topic to be discussed, right, in a, in a, in a HPV forum. So I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Mr. Asif Jha. Uh, Mr. Asif Jha is a hepatobiliary surgeon attached to Cambridge uh, University as well as uh, NHS Trust. Uh, Mr. Sja uh, obtained his MS in Lucknow in 1998. He moved down to UK. He did his HPV and transplant training <coughs> in Liverpool, London, and then later on he joined Cambridge uh, University Hospitals. In 2010, he obtained his consultancy. And since then, he has been uh, a leading uh, uh, HPV surgeon as well as a surgical tutor there. Currently, he is working as a clinical lead. So I would uh, like to invite Mr. Asif Jha to deliver this talk on pancreatic necrosectomy, when and how. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your kind invitation. It is my great honor and privilege to uh, give this uh, plenary talk in the Sri Lanka Surgical uh, Congress uh, meeting. Uh, and today I will be talking about pancreatic necrosectomy with a particular focus on when and how to perform it. We all know that the uh, vast majority of pancreatitis is in fact mild, ca carrying uh, uh, a low risk of uh, mortality, but uh, around a fifth of uh, uh, all cases develop severe necrotizing pancreatitis and the mortality is determined by uh, the secondary infection. The mortality in pancreatitis is usually in two phases. First phase is related to multi-organ failure related to the SIRS, whereas the second phase, which is the one that we will cover in more detail today, is the second phase uh, related to uh, the uh, infection in the uh, necrosis. Here we can see that uh, over two-thirds of all cases of pancreatic necrosis will eventually secondarily get infected, and about 50% of the patients have multiple organisms in it, uh, including uh, uh, fungi. Sepsis is the most important cause of delayed mortality, as we've heard, and the British Society of Gastroenterologists back about 15 years ago concluded that infection, in fact, in fact, troubles the, the mortality. And we can see the, uh, the type of organisms um, in this paper published in BGS in 2006. It shows both uh, various types of bacterial as well as fungal infections. So the key considerations with uh, uh, managing uh, pancreatic necrosis uh, are these three questions. Uh, is the necrosectomy always necessary? And we'll try to find out the answers to these questions. Uh, what should be the ideal timing and then how to do it? These are the pictures of uh, pancreatic necrosis that you, uh, you'll be very familiar with. Yeah. Um, this is a patient of sterile necrosis, and I would like to get this out of the way right at the outset, that the vast majority of the sterile necrosis, unless they are causing any pressure effects or, uh, or, uh, or symptoms simply due to the mass, they can be treated conservatively. Uh, this is the initial CT, and this is a CT four weeks later. I have numerous patients that are under follow-up with large amounts of confluent necrosis, uh, we have who have no symptoms and therefore require no uh, uh, intervention. However, for the patients with infected necrosis, um, the uh, first line of management will be 
uh, uh, establishing uh, adequate uh, drainage. In this case, we have carried out a percutaneous drainage, uh, so uh, and uh, and usually that is sufficient for resolution of large uh, number of patients. Uh, and more recently, we've been doing uh, uh, endoscopic drainage as well, and we can see a metallic hot axial stent lying here between the necrosis here and the stomach. Um, the other avenue that is available to us is percutaneous drain dilatation, and we can not only uh, put percutaneous drains, but also dilate it up to 28 or 30 French size, we call it upsizing, and that usually helps uh, in resolution of necrosis in a significant, significant number of patients as well. So um, this meta-analysis published in BGS uh, about 10 years ago, I included 11 studies with uh, nearly 400 patients, and it was concluded that vast majority of the patients, in actual fact, did not necessarily require a necrosectomy. The mortality was rather high in this uh, study, uh, around 17%, um, which is due to a combination of various factors. Um, but it is clear that uh, uh, a large number of these people had sterile necrosis, and those that did have infected necrosis did not progress to necrosectomy. This finding was subsequently confirmed on the PANTA trial uh, by the Dutch uh, group, which con uh, concluded that over 35% may not in fact require necrosectomy. So the answer to the question, uh, if ne necrosectomy always necessary, is that no, it is not. Uh, uh, for example, in the case of sterile necrosis and those infected necrosis uh, that uh, can be managed with percutaneous drain dilatation and scopic drainage or simply with antibiotics. What are the indications for necrosectomy for us? Um, it is sepsis uh, or indeed the failure to thrive despite all the above uh, managements. Uh, and the pressure effects of sterile necrosis. The commonest investigation, however, is the failure of radiological percutaneous drainage, what we now call as step-up approach. What is the optimal timing of the uh, uh, necrosectomy? There have been numerous studies, and it is widely accepted now that the results of surgery in the first two to four weeks of uh, uh, onset of acute pancreatitis are universally poor. This is because of SERS response, the added insult of surgery on top of the SERS and the ongoing organ dysfunction. And this is compounded by the comorbidities. The pancreatitis, as we know, has acute phase and then rehabilitation phase. In the acute phase of necrotizing pancreatitis, such as the CT scans showing here, uh, there is no indication for drainage early on. Uh, and these are too early for either percutaneous catheter drainage uh, uh, and certainly also for uh, necrosectomy. However, when the necrosis does become walled off, as in the case of this, this patient, and it's also suggested that this be, these might be infected because of the uh, little air pockets trapped within the debris. These are the patients that would be suitable for uh, uh, percutaneous necrosectomy, but with a step-up approach of starting with the percutaneous catheter drainage. Uh, there has been a trial in Mexico City um, some uh, 20 years ago where they looked at early versus late necrosectomy, the early being within the 48 to 72 hours and late uh, after about two weeks. And they had to stop the trial halfway through as they saw uh, an acceptably high risk of mortality in the early group. The same has been confirmed in other studies that the mortality could be as high as 50 to 60%. Uh, in the initial uh, uh, 10 days of management, and subsequently the mortality goes down with the time, and in this case, over a four-week period. So having established that uh, early surgery carries high risk of mortality, and as much as possible, we should, like, we should delay necrosectomy, the question then arises as to how best to perform necrosectomy. Um, for over 50 years ago, 50 years or so, a necrosectomy has been performed uh, by open technique, carrying a mortality in the region of 20, 30, 40%, depending upon the timing of surgery. And this has been uh, done at uh, big centers uh, as well as small centers. And we all have seen this. We have seen the patients that do survive often end up with open uh, laparostomies, 
uh, having gone back to theatre uh, uh, numerous times for various complications of the open necrosectomy. In the uh, beginning of 2000, uh, this paper came out from uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary by Ross Carter, who uh, carried out uh, a percutaneous necrosectomy using the sinus tract dilatation using an endoscope. And this revolutionized uh, uh, how we do the necrosectomy. And, and at, at Addenbrooke's, we follow uh, the, a modification of that approach. We uh, use the drain tract to dilate it up using Seldinger technique in order to avoid, in order to achieve a lavage and debridement and a wide bore drainage. This is the sketch of uh, how we access the cavity, usually between uh, the uh, colon and the uh, spleen in the window uh, and uh, uh, guided by a uh, drain that is inserted in the CT guidance. The patient is uh, laid on his uh, left lateral uh, uh, side with uh, the left flank elevated, or indeed this could be done by a midline or the right flank itself. The approach is usually um, retroperitoneal and under X-ray guidance, the drain tract is dilated using, using a serial Amplatz dilator or even balloon uh, dilatation. Uh, I then use uh, a, a single port technique using a nephroscope, which has multiple uh, working channels, including uh, uh, light, uh, uh, camera, uh, irrigation, and of course, a working channel. Um, this is a, a short clip of how uh, the necrosis looks uh, right at the outset. This is the sheet that is into the, uh, uh, the necrosis, and this is my uh, grasping forceps that I introduce into the sheet and grabbing the uh, dead tissue, which you can see quite clearly here in the middle, along with the wall of the necrotic cavity, which appears more uh, pink in character. Um, the idea is not to touch the, uh, the viable parts of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the necrotic cavity in order to avoid any bleeding right at the outset. The bleeding will cloud the view completely uh, and the surgery will be very difficult to progress with. Um, this is at the outset. The um, next video uh, shows uh, um, how uh, halfway or partway through the necrosectomy the cavity may look like. So we have cleared the cavity quite a long way into the necrosis. And these are the dead tissue which have been detached from the inflammatory uh, lining uh, as you can see, there is ooze from all over, um, and this gets um, more and more prominent as we approach more towards the normal uh, cavity. Eventually, after carrying out um, this uh, uh, necrosectomy over a couple of uh, uh, hours, sometimes depending upon the size of the cavity, it could take as many as three or four hours, we can uh, achieve a fairly clean uh, uh, looking cavity um, which has collapsed uh, usually around the sheet of the drain and we can progress right away through and here you can see by the virtue of these pulsations that we've gone right uh, towards the midline overlying uh, the aorta. Um, we can get lots of necrotic tissue out and as you can see this is just a sample of what we can get out and uh, with perseverance and patience provided there is no bleeding encountered at the time you can clear the whole cavity using minimally invasive uh, uh, single uh, port technique. Uh, this is a picture of a CT scan uh, pre-necrosectomy and then the appearance with the drain all the way across uh, with the cavity completely collapsed uh, 10 days after necrosectomy. Uh, we can uh, do the same thing via two drain uh, technique, both could be dil dilated. Here we have done this uh, from the left posterior lateral approach with a large necrosis here with the drain tract uh, uh, sitting uh, after a few days. Uh, we can do this uh, uh, from the right side as well. Uh, we can do it from midline uh, and of course uh, via multiple uh, uh, combined approaches as well. So um, any uh, way that the radiologist can find uh, us an access into the retroperitoneal uh, collection will be able to carry out a necrosectomy. Um, a large study from uh, Liverpool, uh, uh, which is one of the large centers carrying out minimally invasive necrosectomy, 
uh, compared 137 cases of minimally invasive versus 52 open and demonstrated a clear uh, reduction in mortality. Although the mortality, even for necros minimally invasive necrosecting was still 19%, this was way uh, less compared to nearly 40% with open. Uh, there was also a reduction in the morbidity and the ITU uh, admission, uh, full stop. Um, the um, the uh, German uh, pancreatitis study group demonstrated on a multi-center study, a very similar uh, uh, um, uh, result and they uh, showed that uh, both uh, bleeding, sepsis, uh, multi-organ failure and mortality um, is much reduced in the step-up approach and minimally invasive necrosectomy. And the same has been the conclusion of a meta-analysis of 1980 uh, 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 patients that were published uh, three years ago in gut, uh, favoring either minimally invasive or endoscopic uh, necrosectomy. So um, is open necrosectomy a relic of the past? It certainly carries uh, an, an unacceptable uh, risk of mortality and morbidity, particularly in people that are frail through the necrosizing pancreatitis, and it is an added insult of major surgery in face of pancreatitis and sepsis. So um, the step-up approach has been pioneered mainly by the Dutch pancreatitis group, and we've been following it for the last uh, uh, 10 or so years. Um, as you can see, this is a confront area of necrosis, which has been reduced down to very little simply by drain placement. And if that does not work, we will progress to necrosectomy. Um, this was proven in this uh, very widely known Panther trial, which uh, showed uh, that although there was no reduction in overall mortality, there was a benefit in terms of composite endpoints of major complications and death uh, in patients that underwent a step approach compared to a straight uh, to open necrosectomy. Um, the other technique, which is similar to the minimally invasive technique, but uh, uh, somewhat um, more rewarding for a very large area, uh, and uh, particularly those cavities that are closer to the um, uh, lateral abdominal wall, is video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement, which we sometimes use, uh, and uh, um, again, uh, carries a, a better risk profile compared to open necrosectomy. Increasingly, we've been doing uh, direct endoscopic necrosectomy, which started off with a multi-center study in the United States, the state some 10 years ago, um, which showed that this is feasible um, and carried a, a lower risk of mortality compared to open uh, with about 5% risk of mortality. Um, this is a very important uh, uh, large trial uh, um, done by the Dutch pancreatitis group called Penguin Trial, where they compared the endoscopic uh, uh, transgastric necrosectomy with the surgical necrosectomy uh, and, uh, and showed uh, very importantly that in the first 24 hours, there is a uh, high pro-inflammatory response with, uh, uh, with, this, uh, with a drastic rise uh, in, in interleukin-6 levels. Over a period of a week or so, this, let, this settles down, and uh, this widely explains why there is multi-organ dysfunction and SERS response with, uh, with surgical necrosectomy. Um, although there was no uh, real difference in the major complications of death in this small group of patients, the uh, high uh, pro-inflammatory response was quite striking. Uh, subsequent uh, uh, study, uh, uh, which is again a landmark study by the Dutch group uh, uh, called Tension Trial, compared the endoscopic versus surgical step up approach, the minimally invasive approach, uh, and showed that although, uh, again, there is no reduction in major complications or death, uh, there is clear difference in terms of pancreatic fistula rate for formation and uh, overall uh, hospital uh, length of stay. The same has been conclusion uh, uh, by the single center study in Florida in 2019 that endoluminal uh, endoscopic uh, uh, approach uh, uh, lowered the pancreatic and entrocutaneous fistula rate, although the depth and systemic complications were similar. Um, 
overall, they also showed that the cost uh, of treatment in the endoscopic group was lower. In Addenbrooks, we have a, a very evidence-based uh, approach, uh, and our algorithm is uh, like this. If we see a walled off pancreatic necrosis, if they have these three indications, i.e. sepsis, failure to thrive, or pressure effects, then we will go down the route of either percutaneous drainage, as you've seen, or increasingly now endoscopic drainage and endoscopic necrosectomy. For example, this necrotic collection was drained via hot axios uh, stent. Um, if there is failure of uh, these treatments, then we will progress to minimally invasive uh, uh, therapy. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the answer to uh, the questions that we um, uh, had initially as to when and how to do a necrosectomy, uh, the message is very clear, uh, lesser and late, later, and this has been um, shown by, on, on numerous uh, studies. We know now that millimeter invasive necrosectomy is safer and where possible endoscopic approaches may be even better. Uh, the important considerations are uh, that uh, one should intervene early with percutaneous catheter drainage or endoscopic drainage for sepsis rather than allowing the patient to linger on with sepsis for a prolonged period of time. And of course, the timing of surgery has to be considered quite carefully. So the message is very clear. The step-up approach is the key to management of infected pancreatic necrosis and minimally invasive approaches are superior. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, for listening uh, to this talk. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of Sri Lankan uh, uh, Congress meeting uh, for inviting me, in particular, Professor Siva Ganesh, who is the president of uh, Sri Lankan HPB Association, uh, uh, and, uh, and my friend and colleague, Malit Nandasena, uh, who made uh, all of this possible. Uh, uh, I wish you all the very best for the future and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Many thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ja. Uh, are you with us? Uh, joining virtually? Is he joining virtually? No. I think we are running behind time, so uh, we'll move on to the next session. Thank you very much, okay. uh, Dr. Arinda Dharmapala and Dr. Malik Nandasena. We move on to the symposium number 12, uh, the trauma symposium number two, current status and future of trauma management in Sri Lanka. Uh, I had the pleasure of inviting Professor Srinath Chandrasekhar, uh, President College of Surgeons, and Dr. Mihira Bandara onto the stage to uh, chair the session. Over to you, sir. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, uh, Enhancement of trauma care is now one of the major priorities, which has, it has always been so, but now from this year, uh, trauma care program and the enhancement as well as engagement in it uh, is a specific uh, item uh, for the college. The council has engaged in a 10-year program uh, to develop or further develop trauma systems in the country, and I'm very uh, happy to be a part of this symposium. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Mihira Bandar to uh, commence the session and make any comments. Uh, thank you, sir. So this is uh, going to be uh, based on our trauma committee, uh, recently established trauma committee with the, uh, the different objectives so we have very eminent uh, uh, speakers today uh, to deal with different topics uh, uh, in line. First of all, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Ranjit Tellawala. He's a very senior uh, trauma surgeon in Sri Lanka. Uh, so, So he is the uh, currently uh, country global chair of the NTMC program, and he has done tremendous work in uh, in the training of doctors, uh, 
uh, from the beginning, uh, enrolling PTC and TC program and the developing uh, new courses like DMT program and worked closely with the ministry in improving trauma care. And uh, over to you, sir. Very good morning to all of you. And um, it's extreme uh, pleasure to uh, uh, speak on a subject uh, which is very close to my heart. And uh, thank you for introducing me, uh, the, uh, Professor Srinath Chandrasekhar and the Council uh, for inviting me as well. And um, I'll be talking to you about um, the trauma training which has taken place uh, in Sri Lanka. And um, so uh, what has happened over the period and uh, I have a few more suggestions uh, for the next uh, 10 years. And um, so uh, the, let me take you back to uh, 2003 when we uh, had the first structured trauma course, which was uh, developed by the, the World Society of uh, Anesthesiologists and taken over by um, the College of Surgeons and uh, College of Anesthesiologists. And um, at that time, 10 surgeons and 10 anesthetists were trained in this course. And uh, since then, uh, uh, probably uh, we have done about th more than 39 courses. This is according to my statistic. But I know that um, there are quite a few people uh, like uh, Mahanama and uh, Narendra and um, Colombo North uh, Hospital, um, uh, Dushanti Perera. They did their local uh, courses which are not included in this. Uh, uh, it was a one-day course, and um, it was very uh, interesting to see that, actually. That was the first structured uh, trauma course. And uh, it happened to be such that when we went to peripheries to do this course, I realized that uh, this is the first course that uh, any, uh, some of the people, most of the people have done after their graduation from the medical college. E even the, the public health people used to do this course, actually. They, they were delighted to see a postgraduate course. Anyway, uh, the, we managed to train uh, quite a few uh, doctors in this. And uh, in certain situations, uh, nurses also joined us. And, um, Let's go um, one step further. And um, in uh, the A-Trim course was developed when Professor Mohandas Silva was the president. And um, seven surgeons and uh, two anesthetists were involved in that. And that was uh, conducted between uh, 2004 and 2009. And this was mainly for the surgical trainees. So uh, we didn't have a, uh, the, you know, the, the, we didn't consider the other medical officers who also need the same sort of a training at that time, we were having uh, problems with that. That was a two-day course. And just before this, there was uh, uh, one or two uh, programs of what is called trim courses, where uh, Professor uh, the, um, uh, Mohan Silva and uh, Gamini Gunatilaka, and there was uh, the one resource person from Sri Lankan who was in uh, Buffalo, and he used to do what is called trim course. Um, then uh, the, the Na National Trauma Management course was uh, taken over from Yatsik in 2008, and uh, 10 of us were trained in Ahmedabad, India, and uh, that was uh, still be continuing. We just finished the 46 courses, and uh, this has been very regular, and uh, we have trained about 2,100 uh, medical officers, and uh, two weeks' time we'll be doing the 46 and we were planning for the 50th uh, during this Jubilee celebration. Unfortunately, the COVID uh, hit us. And um, we had uh, four train the trainer courses. And 2008, that was 10 surgeons and anesthetists. And 2012, 17 uh, were trained. And 2014, another 14 were trained just few months ago, and we had 23 um, were trained. And you can see the trend, actually, more and more surgeons and the, the, post, uh, the trainees are going to join to uh, the, join us to do, help us in trauma training, and this is a two-day course. And um, the, m but most of the participants so far are the trainees. But we should be getting uh, the medical officers involved as well who are working in ETUs. Now, um, let me just talk a little bit about uh, more advanced programs and uh, those uh, young surgeons and the, the, the senior registrars and so on, they need to do uh, the course, something uh, the, which is 
need to make a decision making and surgical approach more advanced than uh, you know the ATLS and the, the, the NTMC course. Now, what is well known is a DSTC course by the ESTICS, and uh, the nearly about 50 countries all over the world and conducting DSTC. When we uh, also wanted that that involved um, animal uh, the, the surgery, so that was not a, you know the something for us. In Sri Lanka, we do, and uh, on the similar uh, the sort of a, uh, contents, we developed a DMMT. That's a decision making in major trauma last year, uh, year before, and uh, there were 81 participants. This 81 consists of mainly surgical trainees, anesthetic trainees, and emergency medicine trainees. And hopefully, we will be able to add a module of cadaveric dissection uh, probably next year, and to to complete this course, and. Um, this is a two-day course so far, and uh, the addition of module will take us to a little bit further than that. And um, so uh, we have a nursing course, and which uh, the few of us uh, started in 2010. And uh, so far, we had 17 program, and uh, nearly about 700 or 800 uh, nurses have been trained in this. And uh, the, this year, there was a request from the military, and there is a group of. Um, the nurses and paramedics are going to UN and uh, Sudan whether we could do a training for them and uh, so we thought uh, we'll do that and we added uh, a special uh, paramedical uh, uh, that's called disaster management uh, module and uh, which uh, the, the, the one day course became one and a half days and hopefully this is good this module could be taken by the suicide training which uh, college is hoping to do in future and uh, so we'll see actually how the what the response going to be like and this is going to be the part of the ITCM the what we did we learn over the period uh, few things we learned actually these are good for the future as well now uh, one thing is that uh, once you start a training course and you need to have the second lot of trainers doing very regularly and because as the time goes some people are going to leave the course and uh, this is what we learn actually so i'm so happy that the 23 people actually that is the most uh, the biggest number joined us this actually this also make us life easier and also uh, i feel that the nursing training has been not up to the the number as far as the number is concerned up to the standard so we will be able to do more nursing training as well and the finances actually always come to you know the logistics uh, problem finances how we are going to the, now NTMC not a very profitable uh, for the call, college but we just managed to uh, the buy our hardware with the available money and uh, so so as the nursing courses because it's impossible for us to uh, have you know the 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 uh, course fee increase because that is not very good for the trainees as well. Now, course content, as far as the court concerned, when we did the, the PTC, we realized that was originally a two-day course and which was shrunken to one-day course. When we did the NTMC and the other courses, we realized that the, the entire content cannot be put to one-day course. So I think uh, the you know, two-day course uh, for a, a basic trauma course is going to be like that. And, um, what should we do in future? Anyway, we need to uh, do the, this, continue these courses for the, the thing. I, I, am, I gather that the asset course and Reboa is going to come to this country and that's going to uh, the, you know, help our, uh, the people to improve our trauma uh, the outcome. And team training is, should be on the menu and uh, training uh, the, the team. Team training is a special course and which probably I feel that the, somebody is going to develop that in the country. And uh, one of the important aspect uh, we must get into the, the, the system is the quality improvement, TQ, IP. And uh, so if you think about the lowest of uh, morbidity, mortality, and uh, the preventable death panel, then going to more advanced courses. And, uh, and uh, Manam is going to talk about a uh, little bit of a, a trauma, uh, the, the trade registry as well. Then I also ask uh, Mr. President actually, and the, the, if the president of the next year is in the audience, and uh, whether we could get a uh, few young people to get the DSTC, and uh, this is a very good course, and uh, some of our trainees who have been trained in Australia get the chance of doing it, but unfortunately this is very expensive course. And uh, so we can negotiate with Asian countries whether we could uh, uh, facilitate some of our trainees to do that, 
and um, because they are, uh, the, the country is close by and the traveling won't be that uh, the difficult. And uh, the last one is the trauma fellowship. I, I feel that uh, the, the college should, um, the, you know, the, with the PJIM, should arrange two or three young surgeons to have a, a your trauma fellowship year or two in a very advanced center like US and uh, Australia. This is my suggestion for the future. And uh, please think about that. And that is going to be, uh, you know, because uh, the, to mold a man, and it has to go through uh, the trauma fellowship because that teach a lot of things uh, for our uh, the young surgeons. And um, the, let me uh, uh, give my thanks to people who involved in that uh, College of Anesthesiologists has been with us throughout the period for our training and. Uh, Probably uh, the, they have they continue to be with us uh, for our training, uh, whether it's advanced or basic. And um, America as an NGO, which was uh, during the post tsunami period, helped us a lot in initiating uh, NTMC and so on. And uh, with them, actually, Colombo, WHO Colombo office helped us. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening to me and also asking me to uh, give this presentation. sir for your excellent talk on uh, the trauma training and uh, as you know this year theme is theme is, theme of the year is uh, trauma care development with that we established trauma committee and initiated several uh, the programs uh, i would like to uh, give um, professor srina chandrasekhar to uh, enumerate about our plans. <laughs>